Our next and last speaker for this session is Hugo Powers. He's the chief engineer and founder at Trevor Simple, which is working on a hydrogen-powered fuel cell electric vehicle. And we'll be talking about how they're working at changing uh, the automotive technology. Please join me in welcoming him to stage. Thank you very much, dear, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Hugo Spars from River Simple. River Simple is a sustainable car company, though, rather than specifically a hydrogen car company, because we argue that, in fact, we ha there is a role for both batteries and hydrogen in the future. We don't argue, after all, whether it's going to be solar PV or wind turbines that wins the renewable energy race. They're different. We need them both. And it's really rather a silly question. And the same applies to, to, to batteries and, and hydrogen. We're building, a battery, uh, uh, we're building hydrogen electric cars, which are basically electric cars. They just have no batteries. Because there is no, nothing else that can be remotely as efficient as a hydrogen vehicle for the sort of range to which we've become accustomed. We can decarbonize much more quickly if we have both battery and electric cars. And, um, and, and in fact, we believe, and hydrogen has a, a role to play in any renewable energy system anyway, not just in, in transport. But we believe that the real barriers are, are technical, not technical, they're to do with people and politics and business inertia. So we put as much emphasis onto the business models as well as the, the, the technology. And I'd also like to advance the argument that going through the sort of step change that we're facing today, changing multiple things simultaneously, actually reduces risks and reduces barriers. This, every company, every country is facing this converging funnel of constraints. And <coughs> it's principally uh, environmental pressures, resource depletion and climate change, and the regulatory response, uh, which is a sort of a damage limitation exercise. And businesses that were developed and forged, refined in the 20th century, when we were just a pinprick on the side of the planet, and these constraints weren't really of any great significance at the time, are now bumping along the walls of this funnel. And it's painful and expensive to stay away from the walls. But it's really not surprising, because the profit motive lies way outside the funnel. Manufacturers are still rewarded for using what we're running out of. So River Simple is building business models that turn these costs into a source of competitive advantage. Basically, the more sustainable we are, the more profitable we are. We are moving from linear, a linear economy, one that actually rewards the maximization of resource consumption, to a circular economy that rewards the conservation of resources. Or at least I hope we are, because I don't see how we can ever have a sustainable industrial society based on rewarding industry for the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. It is actually easier to build a business model uh, to suit the constraints of the 21st century than trying to tweak a business model that's designed to do something fundamentally different. But the transformation that I'm talking about here is a system level change. And our businesses and our institutions are not well attuned to system level change. Because culturally, we're still wedded to the idea that changing one thing at a time is the prudent thing to do. Now, to show just how misaligned manufacturers are with uh, society's needs, these are two cars made by the same company, 70 years apart. The car on the left did 13.4 uh, kilometers per litre of petrol, about 38 mpg. But the car on the right only did 13.6. And we've got to remember that less than halfway through that period in 1973 was the oil crisis. So you might reasonably expect to see a little bit more progress than this. But the sad truth is that if you sell cars, there really is no incentive to improve the efficiency. 
it does cost more to make a more efficient car, but customers always discount future cost savings almost to the point of zero. Uh, so it, it effectively, and so they won't pay a premium. And that effectively means that the profit margin is reduced. The only thing then left to improve efficiency is regulation. But because it reduces profit motives, logically and understandably, the industry will only lobby against those regulations and then cheat when they come into force. So we believe that actually the biggest single change we need to see is not one of technology, it's not batteries or hydrogen. We need to make efficiency profitable. And if we could do that, we would see a rash tomorrow of cars that do 50 kilometers per litre, or about 150 mpg. Now, whenever a new idea comes up, all the conversation, like a lightning rod, goes straight to the reasons why it can't be done. And and actually, I accept that, generally speaking, they're probably right. But the assumption is always made that the context stays the same. The new idea is going to replace the old idea in the same context. But the trouble is that that old idea co-evolved in a whole pattern of relationships. And it's all those connections that are the reason why the new idea won't work. If you're prepared to throw away that context and co-develop a completely new pattern of relationships, the new idea can suddenly look an awful lot more appealing. And conversely, if that external context all changes, as I believe we're facing at the moment, new models will emerge, and they will not be a refinement of the old model. When the asteroid hit, Dinosaurs were not replaced by better dinosaurs. And we are facing this sort of scale of change, um, and as I've pointed out. And incremental optimization in such a circumstance is a truly catastrophic strategy. If we're going to make efficiency profitable, we've got to develop entirely new models for the provision of cars such that uh, industry's interests are aligned with those of society. And effectively, we want to, uh, business have got to make more profit from doing the right thing than business, as usual, does from doing the wrong thing. But also, the product has got to change. The car, the car has got to be designed for that business model. And all the drivers will be different. So we'll end up with a completely different sort of car. I regard this is a design problem and i think quite frankly it's it's about the biggest and most complex design problem that i know of today so <clears throat> this is the rasa uh, we've been through four generations of, of vehicle over the last 18 years it's the first car though designed for use on the public road and for type approval and so on it's called the Raza as in tabula rasa or clean slate because we've had the great luxury and opportunity to design a car around the characteristics of hydrogen from a clean sheet of paper. And the result of that is much lower technical risk, much lower cost, and at least three times the efficiency. It does 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in nine and a half seconds. But he does that on a fuel cell that's only 8.5 kilowatts, or 11.5 horsepower. So not quite enough to boil three domestic kettles. It's got a range of nearly 500 kilometers, and, uh, and it has energy efficiency equivalent to a car doing 70 kilometers per liter of petrol, or 250 mpg. Now, this is a car designed within the legacy constraints of the industry for hydrogen. And I don't want to be seen to be critical of the industry, because I don't believe there's a product on the planet that is remotely as good value for money as a modern motor car, with all its complexity and refinement. But unfortunately, I think it's now no longer fit for purpose in the 21st century. The industry doesn't have the luxury that we have of designing from a clean sheet of paper. It has to squeeze the technology, not just into the platform that they've developed, but the entire business model and the culture that has been optimized around combustion engines for the last 100 years. 
It's a bigger car, and I don't want to pretend otherwise, but nonetheless, the comparison is quite startling. It has the same acceleration as our car, um, nine and a half seconds to 100 kilometers an hour, but it has a fuel cell that's over 13 times as powerful to achieve that, 114 kilowatts rather than eight and a half, and it uses over three times as much hydrogen per mile. And this is to explain how we do it. That's a conventional powertrain in a car. All the power for cruising and acceleration, which are the light and dark green arrows, all come from the, the engine. So the engine size for maximum acceleration. But unfortunately, when you're cruising on a motorway, a typical car only uses about 15 to 20 percent of that peak power. And it only accelerates for about 10 percent of its life. So it means that the engine is 80% redundant for 90% of its life. The same is true of the, the entire transmission system. And then the structure is much heavier than it should be because it's designed to hang on to these heavy bits in accidents. In our case, uh, we've got four electric motors in the four wheels. But as I said, we don't have any batteries. We have a fuel cell that provides the electricity. Instead of batteries, the energy is stored in a tank of hydrogen, and it goes through the fuel cell to create electricity on demand for the four motors. Now, a fuel cell is simply electrolysis in reverse. The old school experiment, you have a beaker of water and you put in electricity, out bubbles hydrogen and oxygen. In our case, you put in hydrogen and oxygen, and out comes electricity and water. But that fuel cell is only sized for that 20% required, required for the maximum cruise. It provides electricity to the motors, but they're also the brakes. That's why we've got four motors. And when you brake, they all generate electricity, which is stored in a bank of supercapacitors. Now, that's called regen braking, and lots of cars do it. So the Toyota Prius and other cars like that. But the most you'll ever recover into a Toyota Prius battery when you brake is about 10% of the kinetic energy of the car. We can get over 50% into the capacitors in our car. And this means that the acceleration and, uh, is, driven by, is governed by the motors. The top speed, or maximum cruise speed, is governed by the fuel cell. They're completely independent variables. And we can design a car around those two variables and then optimize the third variable, which is energy efficiency. Um, <clears throat> As I said, the business model is every bit as important. And this is uh, a typical diagram for a, a car today. A manufacturer who sells a car generously will see 40% of the revenues generated by that car in its life. 60% of those revenues go elsewhere. In our case, 100% of the revenues come through us. Because we're probably the only company, car company in the world that hopes never to sell a car. We're, we, the car is designed for a subscription service. We will provide it, um, much like a mobile phone, typically to the first user for a three-year contract. And they have a monthly direct debit that has a fixed priced element and a mileage rate. And that covers all your costs. It's not just the maintenance and so on, but it includes insurance, it includes fuel, critically the fuel. Now, the reason I say critically is because that's what makes efficiency profitable. We are the ones who get all the, all the benefit of the efficiency savings, the cost savings in the life of the car. And um, that justifies us investing in efficiency in the first place. But for the customer, this is a much more convenient way of getting, the ac getting access to the usership of a car. Um, it, it, typically, it's a three-year contract. It's still your own car. It sits in your garage or on your driveway. And, and the, but at the end of the contract, it goes to second, third, fourth-hand customer. We never sell it into the trade. We keep it on our balance sheet. And as well as being a single transaction for all your motoring costs, it's also entirely predictable. And that's true even for the fourth-hand customer with a 10-year-old car. Uh, because the customer doesn't take the risk of any component failure taking the car off the road. We do. And the reason we do that is because, as far as we're concerned, the car will be as reliable as a new one. Otherwise, we wouldn't supply it to you. And remember that the car is designed for this model, so it has no moving parts in the car except for the wheels. 
There are no metal-to-metal -metal, uh, high-speed contacts, no lubricants, oil changes, and mechanical wear. And, and all the structural materials are inert, so there's no corrosion. And uh, the last thing is that we're using this business model upstream into our supply chain as well. So uh, a lot of our components, we're not buying off our suppliers. We're paying for the service of those components, like fuel cells. And they stay on the balance sheet of the supplier. And to enable this, with all the micro-calculations involved for thousands of cars, we're encrypting all the data of all the running and all the components in the car onto the blockchain in the car to automate the development of trust through the entire circular value network that we're creating around the car. <clears throat> This fundamentally changes the car that we make because all our drivers are different. And it deals with the economic barriers from bringing new low-carbon technologies to market. Any new low-carbon car is a premium in the marketplace. And if you sell cars, you've got to get your cost price of car down to match those of petrol engines, which, which are extraordinarily cheap today. But to get the, vol the, the cost down, you've got to get the volume up. And to get the volume up, you've got to get the cost down. So it's a classic chicken and egg problem. However, for us selling the service, pricing is not driven by the cost of the car. Pricing is driven by the lifetime cost of the car. And that has the build cost initially, but it also has all the operating costs and end of life. And we know that when we're designing the car in the first place. So we design it, for instance, for maximum recovery of value, and the industry regards end-of-life uh, legislation as a 200 euro liability in Europe. Um, uh, for us, it's a credit. We also design it to minimize operating costs, because we're paying the operating costs. And actually, we design it to lengthen the revenue stream, because this is a revenue-generating asset that sits on our balance sheet. The longer it generates revenue, the longer we can amortize it over. And all those things offset a higher build cost. So we can come to market at the same price to the customer as a conventional car long before our car is as cheap to make as a conventional car. Now, this is a, a full-blown circular economy model. We, we hear a lot about the circular economy. It's a bit of a bandwagon, and there's a lot of uh, circular economy light models around, I think. And for us, the two key features of a true circular economy model, which really maximizes the benefit or the potential, a one that the car must stay on the same balance sheet from a clean sheet of paper through to end of life. And secondly, we must internalize all the operating costs on that same P&L. And so it's not surprising, it's a completely different car. The circular economy is not just about recycling, it's about moving from sale of product to selling service. They're two sides of the same coin. And we cannot get the full potential unless we do the whole thing wholeheartedly. Now, my industry is, is really very, very conservative. And, and I often find the forecast for the rate of change witheringly modest. Um, so I like to remind people just what can be done. This was the, 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 the best fighter plane that the British could muster in 1938. But only nine years on, the Bell X-1 broke the sound barrier. So given the scale of urgency that we face and, uh, and our creativity, I really would like to uh, uh, urge people to uh, accept the, the, scale, the pace of change that can be achieved if we really have a will to do so. Finally, um, a big picture point I'd like to make. David Lloyd George was a, a, a Welsh prime minister about 100 years ago in the UK. And he said that when you, you can't cross a chasm in two leaps. And unfortunately, culturally, we're so wedded to the prudence of changing one thing at a time. Uh, it's so drilled into us that this is rather counterintuitive. But as I've said, when faced with the scale and the pace of change that we're facing now, we need to, to make multiple changes simultaneously. We need system level change. And to do that, we have to throw off this cultural attachment to changing one thing at a time. Um, <clears throat> we can design systems to suit the constraints of the 21st century. And the devil may be in the detail, but I believe that God is in the system. Thank you very much.